and I'll, I'll okay. turn my video off too once I'm done. Okay. Hi everyone. My name is Martika Parkinson. I am the program a uh, program manager for Thousand Girls Thousand Futures program, and I'm happy to present our science communication channel um, with our partner Wings World Quest. Uh, they have been working with us for about two years now, and they're always helping us uh, provide resources to the Thousand Girls community, and we are very thankful for this partnership, and thank you to our uh, scientists that are online who are taking the time out to speak with you ladies. Um, just some housekeeping rules. So this is a WebEx event. Um, if you're not speaking, um, just so everyone can hear uh, the speakers, please mute yourself. So if you look on the right-hand side, and it's going to have your name on it, just hover over your name, move to the right, and click that mute button. So everyone should be muted during the event. After the event, we'll have about a 15 to 20 minute Q&A segment where you unmute yourself and you're able to ask questions and interact with the speakers. Um, this event is recorded, so we will be sharing this with our speakers our partners, and also other members of the Thousand Girls community that couldn't be able to join there. So just letting you know if you have any um, issues with being recorded, I'm just giving you the disclosure now. So I'd like to introduce our partner from Wings Worldwide, uh, Yael. Uh, she will just uh, probably say just a few words to you guys. Okay, hi, good morning everybody. I'm Yael Nakogan. I'm the Managing Director of Wings World Quest. I'm joining you from New York City today. And we are a nonprofit organization that recognizes and supports extraordinary women in science and exploration, just like the two amazing women that you're going to hear from today. Our goal is really uh, about science communication. What we do is we are a, an international community of amazing women scientists who are studying the natural world. They are uh, exploring and helping us better understand our world and finding solutions to global problems, dealing with conservation. And um, it's just, I, I love learning from them. What we do is we provide funding for their work through um, grants and we, we give awards to recognize their work so that more people can um, see, see what they do and understand how much women scientists are contributing to, um, to advancement and conservation and understanding our world better. So um, for um, science communication, um, you know, as you learned in your program, it's so important because, it, you know, if you don't share what you learn, what good is it? And, you know, one example, for better or for worse, um, the, our elected officials, who may not be scientists, are making laws that, um, are, you know, uh, that, that re rely on science. And so one thing I just want to throw out there to all of you um, is just to think, even if it's for a second, about running for public office one day, because any, any um, foundation you have, whether it's science, um, you know, you, you, could, you could be that person one day making these laws. So um, I don't want to take up all the time, so I'm going to introduce um, Meg Lo Dr. Meg Lohman and Dr. Becca Pichotto. Um Dr. Lohman is joining us today from Germany, where she is doing a fellowship. She actually is based out of California, but travels around the world. She is a pioneer of forest canopy exploration. She uses hot air balloons and walkways so we can better understand what's living in our treetops how they prosper, and how we can benefit from their hidden gifts. She's passionate about sharing her work with youth, and especially girls, to inspire scientific in inquiry. Last year, she carried the Wings World Quest flag on an expedition to Ethiopia, where she teaches the clergy there about the importance of protecting their forests in the hopes that they, in turn, can influence the rest of the community. It's really brilliant science communication at work. Um, Dr. Becca Pichotto is an archaeologist. She is joining us today from Texas. Where are you, Dallas? Dallas? Yeah, Dallas. Um, the nature of her work demands that she communicates the origin and the meaning of artifacts she finds, including human, um, from long ago. She's part of a team that made a significant discovery 
in a deep, narrow cave in South Africa of an ancient human relative of ours. I love reading her blog post about a project uh, for which she carried the wings flag. It's a swamp in Virginia in the United States where African slaves hid after escaping. It's a fascinating project. Uh, so we are honored to have them as part of, of the WINGS community, and I am looking forward to learning from them today by listening to them. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lohman. Hey, thanks, Yael. Thanks, you guys, for being here. And it's dinner time in Munich, Germany, so I'm just laughing because maybe it will start getting dark pretty soon over here. Um, wonderful to be here. I want to just spend the next 10 minutes telling you a little bit about my career as a woman in scientist, which is called an Arbornaut, and where astronauts study outer space, Arbornauts actually study the tops of the trees, which is kind of the link between the planet and the atmosphere, which is really kind of cool. The next slide shows my embarrassing childhood and how on earth did I become a tree scientist. Um, this is about the only picture my mother ever took of me, but in fifth grade I had a big wildflower collection. I grew up in a really rural part of upstate New York, far from where all these guys are in New York City, and um, there wasn't a whole lot to do, but I collected flowers on the side of the road and made, pressed them into telephone books, and lo and behold, I took it to the fifth grade science fair and won a, fifth, a second prize with about 500 boys that all had volcanoes experiments, those baking soda things where the volcanoes explode. So lo and behold, I got really excited and thought maybe a girl could be a scientist someday. So the next five slides show you my toolkit. And the crazy thing is I went from that fifth grade wildflower collection to really get excited about trees. And I, lo and behold, discovered myself wanting to figure out how long leaves lived on trees in tropical rainforests when I got a scholarship to Australia, of all places. And yet no foresters ever climbed the trees. So my advisor for my research said, you just have to figure out how to climb the trees. So here's the date. I know it's way before most of you were born, but 1979, I sewed a harness from seatbelt webbing. I forged a metal piece of, to make a slingshot, and I borrowed a rope from somebody, and I went up into the canopy. And if you want to scroll through the next five slides, they'll show you what I've developed since then. Here's one of my students in a redwood tree, which is really extreme rope climbing. 300 feet high, but it's really awesome and fun. And I think the next slide shows you me and a few others in Taiwan, of all places, where the forests are extraordinary and huge. And I put little arrows so you can see us because we're so little. But again, the same technique, using our harnesses, our ropes, and a big old slingshot to get those things up in the tree. Because um, you can't take more than one person on a road, in about 1985, I made this crazy invention, which we now call a canopy walkway. And that was when I was still living in Australia, because how do you get 20 students up in the canopy all at once? So here's a couple of pictures of those cool things, which is the second major tool in my toolkit to study forest canopies. Then the third tool, maybe my favorite, because I feel like the Wizard of Oz, is using inflatables, hot air balloons and an inflatable raft, allow us to really fly over the tops of trees and land in the very uppermost canopy. And finally, tool number four, using a construction grade. If you're really wealthy, like the Smithsonian or a few other places, you can get a crane. It costs about a million dollars, but if you use that bucket and study the canopy from a crane bucket, you can survey all the leaves in one tree or all the lizards on the tree or all the sloths living in the tree or whatever it is you're excited about. So I think that's it for the toolkit. And lo and behold, here's what I discovered at the top of a tree. 
50% of species on the Earth live in the top of a tree. It's really crazy, but we never knew that until about 1985. And yet we've been to the moon in the 1960s, and we've done scuba gear in the 1950s. So the toolkit for my world is an Arpernaut is very late in design and instrumentation, but we're trying to catch up because forests are really, really important. A couple of the crazy things about that 50% is most of them are insects. They're really kind of beautiful. I hope you don't swap too many bugs in your life, but insects are everywhere and especially up in the treetops. Other cool things about my work is that, you know, tree climbing is kind of cool. Most kids have climbed a tree at some point in their life. And here, for example, is a canopy walkway I built in Florida, the first public canopy walkway in North America. And these third graders that I worked with discovered a new species of weevil in the Florida canopy, and they got published in third grade. So you don't really have to work all your life to make a big discovery in the treetops. You just have to use your eyes and ears. And here's even my own kids. I was a single mom, so I had to do a lot of work where my kids had to be with me. And guess what? They learned to climb trees pretty young. And um, even they loved doing canopy work. They were great finders of beetles and counters of leaves. Oh, and that, maybe we went backwards. We'll go the other way. There we go. And the last five summers, I've even had kids in wheelchairs. You know, a lot of people think, well, if you're disabled, you can't become a scientist. And I really felt that was a terrible thing. So I worked pretty hard to get this grant where I took kids that were mobility limited. And guess what? They learned to climb trees, and they discovered a lot of cool new species living in the forests of North America. So you don't even have to go very far to make new discoveries. So I want to just finally end up with my wonderful Wings World Quest expedition because I think it's important for all of us to realize that forests are totally essential for our life. And if we lose many more forests, we are doomed. Our children will not have any kind of life on this planet. So let's move to Ethiopia here where you can see how hot and dry it is for people that are going shopping. On Saturday, all these people are taking their stuff to the market, but without any forest left, it's really tough. And Ethiopia has lost 95% of its forests. So let's see a picture on the next slide of how that looks. Here's an aerial survey of Ethiopia in the region where I'm working. You can really strain your eyes. You can see those little tiny green dots, which are the remaining forests in northern Ethiopia. If we go closer, you can see that each of those little green dots looks like this. In the center is a round building, which is the church, the Coptic or Christian Orthodox Church in Ethiopia. But if you look around the edges of that greenery, you'll see how the farmers have mistakenly plowed too close. You'll see how the forest is getting thinner because the cattle have been eating all the seedlings inside. And basically, these forests are the last native species seed bank and bird habitat and pollinator habitat and the source of fresh water and medicines and spiritual values for everyone in northern Ethiopia. So they can't afford to lose them, but of course the priests don't ever go out of their forest, so they don't realize that so much of the surrounding area has been cleared. So here in my night, pretty crazy, but this was my Wings World Quest challenge, was to go and work with these priests, because in a funny way, I'm a biologist that wants to save biodiversity, but they are clergy who want to save all of God's creatures, so we really have the same mission. And so I've been leading workshops in Ethiopia every year, and each time I teach about 200 new priests, and every time I do that, the priests realize that, holy cow, we have a treasure in our forest, and we have to protect it. So here am I now. I have the only uh, permit from any Western person 
in the world to go into the church for us. I'm very honored about that. And the head priest has made me promise that I will not stop coming to Ethiopia until we save all of the important biodiversity and all of God's creatures. To do that is a big challenge. And the priests invented the solution. They realized that they take the stones out of the farmer's fields, which the farmer loves. They can build walls around the forest. And if they build the walls a little away from the trees, they can actually increase the size of the forest. And in exchange for that, I fundraise in the states and get donations to give every priest a little donation to his church if he puts a wall around his forest. And you'll see from this slide that I'm, uh, it was a half a million dollar project and I'm over halfway there. I'm really excited that we almost have half of the highest biodiversity forest in Ethiopia saved for the children of the future. And here are those children of the future. All the kids love nature. They love the bugs and they love the trees, but they don't have any books in their school. They don't have any computers or cell phones. In fact, a lot of them even wear a blanket to school, which is what they sleep in because they don't even own a t-shirt. So the, the need is really great over there for not only saving the forest, but providing some environmental education. So one of my projects has been to write a book for the kids over there, and it's about a little girl who helped save the forest of Ethiopia. I chose a girl in hopes of making some inspiration for the kids over there, and every time an English copy of this children's book is sold on Amazon.com or in a bookstore, I can purchase a free copy in Amharic because we've added a little on to the English price. And every year I take hundreds of books over and give them to the kids who have never, ever owned even one book in their whole life. And this book, in their language, teaches them a lot about the importance of trees. <laughs> Here I am giving books out in one of the schools. I always give to the girls first, and oh boy, the boys are really insulted because there's it's a very chauvinistic culture, but it's really important, I think, for the girls to learn about nature because they will be the environmental stewards of the future. They run the gardens, they raise the food, they raise the children, and I'm really excited about sharing these books with the girls and boys of Ethiopia. So that about wraps it up, my little world of discoveries in the treetops and hopefully using my canopy research to save forests around the world. Thanks so much. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Loman. Now we'll move on to our next presentation. Just give me a few minutes while I pull that up for you. Well, literally just need one second. You know, technology is so great, but technology is always failing. <laughs> so hilarious. How is this possible? Why don't you want to open PowerPoint? I'll just. Well, also, uh, while she, you're doing that, um, thank you so much, Dr. Lohman. And uh, you can also read her flag report on our website, wingsworldquest.org. Uh, so she has you know, communicated the, this work in many different ways. Okay, so okay. we're all set. Okay. I have it up. Let me uh, put in presentation. Thank you everyone for your patience as we work through our technology issues. I think it might just be me today. I don't know if it's even technology. I'm just gonna say that it's me. <laughs> I'm having a technology issue. Yeah, the PowerPoint is weird. It's not even moving. Give me one second. Let me stop sharing because sometimes it takes more internet speed to share. And I will make it in. Oh. 
I'll just, uh, while you're doing that, I'll, I'll just come to, I, I love um, how you found the, um, the common language that you talked about with, with the clergy between, um, yeah, saving God's creatures and, and, and how the, the actions affect, um, you know, the, the forest and the life around them and that that even inspired them to create their own design. So, you know, and that's, that's such a that really point. fascinating, yeah. Yeah, you know, four billion people on the planet believe in spiritual, you know, salvation and all of God's creatures. And in some way, we, conservation biologists have never worked with religious leaders. It's been off the map. And suddenly I'm realizing we've kind of missed the boat. And maybe by introducing this as a really great case study, we can do more. I'm working in India now with sacred trees. And I'm going to Bhutan in a month to work there on sacred forests because so many people believe in that. So hopefully it's kind of a good success story. So we are all set. All right. Take it away. Great. Um, hi, my name is Becca Pichotto. I am an archaeologist, like Gail uh, said. Um, and when I carried the Wings World Quest flag, I was working in a cave, in, uh, sorry, not in a cave, in a swamp in Virginia, um, where I did my PhD uh, and my master's research there. And I was part of a team that was uh, investigating um, maroon communities, so communities of, of so-called runaway slaves, African, Africans and African Americans who were enslaved in the southern United States uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries. And we found that um, as people took themselves away from enslavement, they came into the swamp. And, and even today, the swamp is seen as a really remote, dangerous, scary place. It's just like a blank spot on the map. Um, and my colleagues and I, whoops, you can go back a second. That's what we're oh, saying. Sorry, that's okay. My colleagues and I um, found islands within the swamp and, and where these maroon communities were living. So um, that's not what I'm going to talk about mostly today, but it does connect to this work that I do underground because uh, I'm really interested in places that we in the 21st century now see as being remote and understanding that not everybody thinks of them as remote and through history uh, they you know people have been all over the landscape all over the world throughout history and even though we think a place is desolate or nobody lives there there's a good chance that there that there were people there in the past and and um, I just I find that very a very interesting thing to think about about whose stories are getting told and, and whose stories we think about so um, I love that uh, Dr. Lohman is an Arbornaut because in the uh, when I started working in this cave in South Africa, we were dubbed underground astronauts because Terranaut was too hard to like think of. Um, and you can see my colleagues and I here are trying to mimic the Apollo uh, Apollo pose of the famous astronauts. Uh, and you'll notice that all of us in that picture are women. And uh, that was not a deliberate choice by the principal investigator, the lead scientist on this project. But instead, it reflects the reality of the field of paleoanthropology and archaeology. You know, it's still seen from the outside and even from the inside as being a field that's dominated by men. But in fact, um, there, there are uh, there's pretty good parity in the in the numbers of women who are studying these fields and who are active in these fields. Um, so six of us there were chosen in 2013 to go uh, do some work in this cave in South Africa in the cradle of humankind. Then we'll go to the next slide. Um, and we didn't know it in 2013, but uh, when we first went underground, but we learned pretty quickly that in that cave were the fossils of an uh, ancient human relative that we now call Homo naledi. So they're in our genus, we're Homo sapiens, and Homo naledi is in our genus. So they're, they're fairly closely related to us, but we don't quite yet know how they're related. Are they a distant cousin? Or are they an ancestor? Or that We're not quite sure about that yet. We're still working on it. Um, but we found remarkably um, the remains of, I think we're up to 18 individuals now. We've got more than 2,000 individual fossil elements, and these all date to about 250,000 years. There's a reconstruction of, of what we think this, um, these, these guys look like. I don't know why the artist made that one look so grumpy, but uh, maybe that's just because we dug him out of the cave and he's not happy. I don't know. Uh, you can show the next picture there. Next slide. 
Oh, and, I, and again, there we go. So this is a map of the cave. So you can see where in South Africa we are, just outside Johannesburg. Um, we're near a whole bunch of other really famous uh, fossil hominid sites. We're really close, about 800 meters from the oldest known controlled use of fire. Uh, and we are close to the site where the Tom child was found and where a bunch of Australopithecines have been found. There's, there's a lot of early fossil hominids around this area. Um, and, and yet, um, as, um, as Dr. Lohman was mentioning, you know, there's discoveries that, we, that she makes in the canopies of forests in North America, sort of right where, we're, where the scientists are, are based. Um, and, and, you know, they're, they're coming sort of late in the game of the science that we're still making these discoveries. And here in South Africa, it's the same thing. There are things right underneath our feet, literally underneath our feet, where people have been looking for fossils for decades but not looking, you know, maybe not looking underground or, or saying, oh, there's nothing there, so we're not going to bother. And really, there's lots more to be discovered. Um, so you can see in that map of the cave there that, that we're going 30 meters underground. It's about 200 meters or so from the nearest entrance. And that journey takes us about, well, nowadays it takes us about 25 minutes because we're all in a little better shape and more used to the route. But when we first started, it was taking us about 45 minutes to go the length of two football fields. So that's pretty slow going. Um, and this next thing is going to be a video that I will play, um, and you'll you'll see us removing some fossils from the cave here in this video. It should just play automatically when it gets to the slide. I hope. Yeah, here we go. So it's a little jumpy. I've got a, a helmet cam on, and you can see that bag that my colleague Marina there that we're moving out of the cave. That weighs about 25 kilos, uh, and it's a it's plaster encased fossils and sediment that we're trying very, very carefully to get out of the cave. Now, you know, ordinarily that wouldn't seem like such a big deal, but you can see how small these spaces are. Everything that goes in and out has to fit through an 18 centimeter uh, uh, gap that's, that's sort of the pinch point for everything. And you'll notice we're using lots of ropes, lots of harnesses. Um, we're doing a lot, of, a lot of rigging that's not, not entirely unlike what Dr. Lohman does, but we're just doing it underground in the dark. Um, and you can see there's, there's lots of us on the team. There's about four, five or six of us that are the primary excavators, but we work with colleagues who are safety cavers that help us with the rigging, that help us, um, you know, make sure that, that all of our technology works underground. And then, of course, we have uh, our team is about 150 scientists all over the world that help analyze these fossils and figure out what they mean and, and you know, do what bones do we have and how do they fit together and all of that. Sorry that's playing so jumpily there. But you can see how much uh, teamwork and, and how physical some of this work is in addition to being, um, you know, the, the um, very particular careful parts that you need to do in science. Um, you know, we take lots of notes, we excavate with toothpicks and paintbrushes. Yeah, you can advance. Thanks. Maybe? Perfect. So these next few slides are just some, some pictures of the area where we work. Uh, you can see in the top there, that's the, the landscape around the cave. And way off in the distance, you might be able to see a little red building. That's our uh, sort of our base camp where we store some of our equipment. Uh, and then these other pictures around are, are pictures of the fossils in uh, both in situ, so both in the ground. On the uh, left-hand side, you're seeing uh, some ribs. And if you look really closely, there's part of a hand and, and uh, some teeth in there. Um, we've got a jaw there that's in the, a lower jaw, a mandible that's in the lab after it had been excavated and prepared. Um, and you can see, uh, I believe that jaw, some of those teeth actually have dental caries in them. They've got a couple little cavities. Um, and then the, uh, the picture on the right is actually a hand, an articulated hand. So it's the hand that um, if you laid your if you just had a hand that had all the skin on it and you put all the, you put it laid it down and then just left it there and all the skin and organic material went away and you were just left with the bone and that's what it would look like there so it's articulated okay next slide uh, and these are some of my colleagues so um, the original team of us who were selected to go underground were um, from Canada New Zealand and the United States and Australia I believe 
Um, but we were working very closely with colleagues in South Africa. And since then, since 2013, um, we've really made a conscious effort to help uh, South African scientists and people who are interested in paleoanthropology and caving um, to come into the field. So we're actively recruiting people. Um, in fact, right now there is an ad out for more people to join our team. So if you, you or someone you know is interested, you should check, look for that. Um, and uh, these, are, these are four of my South African colleagues uh, who do excavation and cave exploration. Um, and actually only one of them, Mpume there in the middle, she's studying for her master's in archaeology, but the rest of them have degrees in something other than science. Um, or don't have a college degree at all, but they're still actively involved in the project um, and, and are scientists, but they're um, either still working on their degrees or that's not part of their path. So um, there's a lot of ways to be involved in science. Okay, next slide. Oops. Yeah. Uh, we use a lot of different kinds of technology. Uh, as I said, we have so many colleagues around the world and, and they all have different specialties. My specialty is the excavation um, and the methods we use to collect our data. Um, but I have colleagues who specialize in different parts of the skeleton, people who study specifically the skulls or parts of the skulls, um, people there on the right who work with the 3D reconstructions that are experts in that. It really takes a lot of people with different specialties to do this kind of work as a team. Next one. Uh, and here you can see some more, um, another example of, of how many women there are really involved in paleoanthropology and doing this cutting edge science. These are some of my colleagues. It looks like they're analyzing a mandible, so a lower jaw and maybe an upper jaw there. Um, so yeah, that's just an example of, of more folks working. I think that's the last slide. Oh, nope. Um, so I mentioned that we are actively recruiting right now. Um, we are looking for folks who have a, a master's in, in archaeology, so, or paleoanthropology. So that might be a couple years off for some of you, but um, it's something to keep an eye on if, if uh, this kind of work interests you. And then on the left there, you can see uh, just a picture of, of what it looks like in the cave where some of those fossils um, were found. Um, in terms of science communication, we actually Skype with classrooms around the world from underground. Uh, so classes can take virtual field trips. Um, we're on Twitter as we're working. We're really, we're really excited and think it's important to uh, tell people how this process works in, in real time even. Um, and that's what I do uh, when I'm that's part of my job here in Dallas at the Perot Museum of Nature and Science is, is helping to um, get more people involved in, in that science communication side of things. So, there we go. Thank you so much. That was great. And you have a, a new virtual reality um, program as well for this. We do. Yeah. Uh, so there's there are fewer than 25 people who have been into that part of the cave because of this 18 centimeter gap that you have to pass through. Uh, so not a whole lot of people get to see it in real life, but we did do some filming for virtual reality in there um, just earlier this year. And on the 18th of September, so coming up really quick, um, we're making an app, a virtual reality app available to the public for free. So anybody can download the app and um, look at the cave on their cell phone uh, with Google Cardboard or any other kind of virtual reality headset. Um, it's pretty exciting and we actually have a narration for it in, in uh, five different languages. So um, it, you'll be able to listen to it in Isizulu, uh, Setswana, Setsu, Spanish, and English. And all voiced by scientists who are in part of the project. That's great. Yeah, I can say with certainty that I will not ever try to follow you down into that cave. I might go into the treetops <laughs> with Dr. Lohman, but I'm glad that you have the virtual reality <laughs> so that I can see what you're doing in that tiny little cave. <laughs> okay, so um, I think Martika, you're going to take questions, right? Yeah, so uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I definitely learned a lot and I know um, our Thousand Girls audience has too. Um, now I'd like to open the floor up for questions that you might have for either of the scientists. So everyone is currently mute now. So if you want to ask a question, um, I'm going to unmute everyone. So you can just go, just if someone starts talking before you, just stop and let them go because um, we do have a few people online. But when someone starts 
talking, their name is going to just pop up on your screen. So, you know, just uh, just let them go and then you'll go next. So I am unmuting everyone now. So feel free to ask any questions you have. Um, hi. Hello. We can hear you. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Oh, Lohman. One second. First, can you introduce yourself and say where you're from, what grade you're in, um, whether you're a mentor or a mentee, just so they're aware. Uh, um, my name is Jolina, and I'm from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. I'm currently in grade 11. And I'm a mentee of the Thousand Girls Thousand Future program. So I, my first question is for Dr. Lohman. Um, how do you think we should conserve our forests as wildfires increase every year? Oh, what a great question. Um, first of all, I'm going to tell you because you're from Vancouver, make sure you go and visit the canopy walkway up there, which is in the botanical garden of the university, if you haven't done it already, just to have some fun. Um, because I also work in California pretty close to you, um, I'm watching fires become more and more critical. Obviously, fires are worse as we cut forests down because the conditions become drier and the edges become more exposed. So if we could implement policies to keep forests, that would be fantastic. Um, I think secondly, we need to be paying a lot of attention to replanting forests. Uh, some of the western trees are enormous storage of carbon, which is huge for the planet and really important because their root systems can get access to water tables that you and I can't. So replanting trees is really critically important as well. I think we have our work cut out for us now, and of course the more we can minimize the amount of energy that we all use to keep that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, uh, the better chance we might have for letting these trees do their work, which is of course absorbing carbon and making the planet a little bit more healthy for you and me to live on. So thanks for asking that really great question. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Policies, lawmakers, and um, we had a, a webinar earlier this year for our Wings World Quest fellows and, and flag carriers, little lobbyists, to talk about how they can, um, you know, communicate and get meetings with their local representatives and Congress people. Because again, it, it uh, you know it all comes down to um, relaying the science and the importance of it. So a lot of it depends on the policy in the end. I think I have a question. So I know like setting a stencil as a woman is definitely hard and you experience some challenges. What is one challenge that you experienced throughout maybe your undergraduate studies or your your um piece for your doctorate or in the workforce? How did you overcome that? Becca, do you want to go first? Uh, Sure. So I was, uh, I've been very lucky to have very supportive mentors uh, throughout my my master's and my PhD program. Uh, I, yeah, I've, I've been, I've, I count myself very lucky to have had very supportive mentors who who recognize my experience in the, in wilderness and in um, sort of in, in these sort of tougher environments um, and 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 made space for me in the projects to uh, push some of the boundaries of the projects in terms of the physical spaces that we were going into, both in the cave and in the um, and in the swamp. Um, so I've been been very well supported in that. I think one of the things that I've that I've experienced the most challenge with is um, 
is when some of these projects have been publicized, we get lots of great media attention. We want the media attention so we can share our science with the public. Um, there's, to me, there's been a, a lot of attention on the fact that some of my teams are, are all women teams and there's been concerns about our body sizes and these sorts of conversations that, you know, I don't need the press talking about my body size, for example. Um, and that's been distracting and frustrating because I want them to talk about the science that we're doing and not that we're all women or the, the um, interesting things that we're finding and not the fact that we're small. Um, and and that's, been, that's been frustrating to me. Um, and to overcome that kind of challenge, um, we've, we've kind of banded together the people on the, on the different teams um, and, and talked, talked about it with each other and sort of presented a united front. There's been, um, I don't know, for lack of a better word, a sisterhood in, in, in trying to combat some of these things um, and choosing when it's appropriate to speak out and when we're just going to be like, oh, it's just not worth our energy to talk about that one. We'll save our energy to talk about the next the next sort of challenge that comes along. Um, so, so for me, I think that's, that's the challenges I've experienced in the last several years. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm writing a book right now about the challenges of being a woman in science. So stay tuned. I will give you a copy, I promise. My situation has been quite the opposite where, for example, I never had a woman advisor or professor or teacher in my whole life in science. So I had uh, a whole kind of, you know, diversity of hurdles along the way, including being the only woman when I went to Duke for grad school and then being the only woman when I went to Sydney University for grad school and the chair of the department said, why are you doing a PhD when you'll only get married and have children? What a waste. And so I had to always bite my tongue. I was very shy and um, try hard to work harder than the men. And then lo and behold, I was a single mom, which made it really tough because obviously I had to take my kids to work a lot more than my male counterparts. The canopy world is still pretty male dominated. Um, in my case, I tend to work in countries, what well, emerging countries, there's a lot of comfort zones and if you go to Panama or Costa Rica where all the air conditioning exists, but I work in Ethiopia and India and Western Samoa and Malaysia. So in those cases, um, I also work there because the women don't have much opportunity and I feel that it's so important for us as women scientists to mentor women that are outside of our comfort zone, to mentor those girls in rural India and Bhutan and places where they've never even known that a woman could be a scientist because that's how my childhood was and I feel that I feel so much empathy. So I've really come I guess out of the school of hard knocks but it gives me a lot of sense of how we can maybe help this generation do it a lot better than I had. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Hello? Hi, we can hear you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Be sure to introduce oh. yourself and say if you're a mentor or mentee and where you're from. Hi, so my name is Gagan. I'm a mentor and I'm a postdoc in Columbia University. Um, I am from India originally and I have a question for Dr. Lohman. Um, you talked about your, uh, your working on a project uh, on sacred trees in India. Could you tell me more about that? Please? I'd love to. And you can also email me canopymeg at gmail.com. I'm working uh, with the group called ATRI, Ashoka Trust Research on Ecology and the Environment out of Bangalore and also a faculty group at Kerala. Um, and so I love India. Oh, I'm getting homesick thinking about India because I think India is such an amazing country with a billion people but 20% of their primary forest has been conserved, which is a lot higher than the U.S. ever conserved of primary forest. Um, it's just not accessible to people. So through the sacred trees, through thinking about how people view forests and villages, 
I hope we can come up with some really great uh, ideas and policy that will help India really conserve those forests into the future. Uh, so for now, we've been doing some uh, comparative studies about why do villagers really value those trees. We've actually even been comparing it to my Ethiopia world where we have these religious spiritual values that have overpowered uh, the economic temptation to cut the trees down. And I think India is in a really amazing place right now where a lot of these tensions are coming to the fore, but at the same time, I think the religious values are very strong and I'm excited for India's future in terms of forest conservation. So feel free to send me any notes and I don't know where in India you're from, but there's just an amazing diversity of forests in, in India. It's a fantastic country for forests. Okay. Thank you. That was that's such a cool project and I'm very impressed. I will definitely email you. I'm from Punjab, Northwest, but I moved to US for grad school a while back. And I'm in cancer genetics, but I would love to be, you know, in any way involved in the project. If I can okay. help with something. I'd so. love to talk to you. Yeah, because I'm going soon to do a drone workshop for Indian mm -hmm. scientists. So, again, just trying to take the toolkit to people that might not have the, you know, kind of the U.S. perspective. And I'm really excited. So i love to hear from you a little more offline. Thank you. Oh, definitely. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you also. Thank you. Okay, does anyone else have any questions? So we have about five more minutes left before we close this event. It's a great opportunity to ask them about their STEM career path, ask them about their research. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity that the Thousand Girls Network gets to school to scientists, different disciplines. So make sure you take advantage of this opportunity. So I'm going to ask one question for the, the girls in the community. Um, what's some advice that you would give uh, young girls who are just uh, starting in their STEM field? All right, I'll lash out there and just say, don't be afraid of science and math in school. My teachers always told me girls couldn't do those things, but I think it's, and you don't have to be the top in the class, but you just have to do it. And also, just volunteer for everything. Maybe it's doing water quality in your local creeks. Maybe it's helping kids after school with their math homework that are in elementary school. Maybe it's a summer opportunity to work for a lab or a park or somewhere. I think for me, the fact that I always said yes to volunteerism in addition to having the part-time jobs that I, of course, needed to put myself through school helped me enrich my career a little more. And also, with luck, you'll have wonderful women mentors. I think the most important thing, too, is to keep that sisterhood really foremost in your career because good women, colleagues, and friends and mentors are so, so important for success. And I I would say, um, for me, my path to archaeology was not very straightforward. Um, I started off studying engineering as an undergrad. Uh, I ended up with a degree in Russian uh, and math, and then I went and worked in wilderness education for a long time before I came back to graduate school uh, to study archaeology. Um, and all of those things, you know, that I did before I started doing archaeology, all of those things come, have come to play in my current career. Um, so. You know, if you if you decide to major in chemistry or something in, in college, um, continue to pursue your other interests because you never know how all these things are going to intersect as you move forward with, with your career. And the, um, you know, the more people I meet who who are maybe didn't do science careers straight away, they're bringing in lots and lots of different skill sets that really help build up the science that they're doing, or people who, who have science degrees and, and have other interests, and really help build build up what, what we're doing and bring new perspectives to the science. So um, don't think that you only have to take science classes. Take some of the other interesting stuff that, that you're passionate and interested in as well. 
So someone gave us a question uh, through the chatting feature, so I'll uh, moderate their question for them. So uh, the question's from a mentor. Uh, her name is Marita. She's a postdoc at Brown University. Um, given the nature of the products discussed in this panel, how does communication play into rising awareness and cooperation of local populations at the project site? Well, that's a fantastic question, and that's the essence of everything. I think for my project in Ethiopia, it's all about building trust. And building trust is about communicating, finding out what's important to the people. I will say one thing I've learned, and this is probably very radical for American academics, is that the priests in Ethiopia don't care how many publications you have, and they don't even really need publications. They would like to see action on the ground to save their forest. So it's really caused me to reinvent my science, especially in a museum world where it's not about writing grants and publications, it's about figuring out how to implement on the ground effective conservation that requires the trust of the people. So that question is really the essence of, for me, how to do good science in other countries. We can't do it without local community support and trust and, you know, being very sure that we are rewarding their values, not ours. Uh, and I think in the part of South Africa where I work, uh, there's a lot of pride uh, in the fossil hominid uh, resources that are in the cave or in that in that region um, because there's so much and it's a big part of the forest industry and economy there really um, and uh, so we we have partners in in the region that, that help us communicate to the local um, to the local people and with the local schools and um, with the different businesses that are around um, to to help uh, yeah to help support the economy and help support um, uh, students in South Africa and, you know, with their interest, if people are interested in, in paleoanthropology and they want more training, we can, we can help connect them with those kind of resources. And that's a really important part of it. And then for me, um, for example, there's a family that helps manage the property where the cave is and um, their English is um, not, it's not their strongest language and, and Sasutu, I don't speak a word of it. Um, and that's the that's one of the languages they speak. You know, we find ways to communicate. But for me, um, initiatives like partnering with the Sitges speaking scientists to have the narration for a virtual reality be in that language. Um, to me, that's that's an important thing that that we're trying to do to communicate um, to bring more people involved in, into the into what we're studying. Um, and in their own languages and in, in ways that are culturally appropriate um, for, for that area. So, um, yeah, communicating and being involved in the local community, I think, is, is really key to, to having local support and, and interest in the science that we're doing. So I just want to say thank you to all. Okay, I have one more question that came in. Uh, so this is a global pro program. I always encourage people. Um, sometimes it might be an internet access issue um, with them having low bandwidth to send questions through the chat. Uh, so we do have an another question. So um, this is from Julie. She is a mentor and she's from Greece. Uh, she is a PhD student at Columbia. And she would like to ask both of you wonderful ladies, um, what, your, what are your future plans in research field, in your research field? And how do you see your, what do you see yourself doing in the next five years? Oh, Julie, this is a very intense question. <laughs> so, oh, go ahead. Okay, you want to go? Okay, sure. Uh, so in the next five years, um, I'm continuing to work underground in the cave, uh, but as I mentioned, my specialty for that project is less about the analysis of the fossils and more about the excavation and the methods we use. And I'm really excited in the next few years to start a landscape survey of the area around uh, around the cave using uh, LIDAR and uh, you know surface archaeology, more things that are like what I did in the swamp, um, but in this landscape around the Rising Star Cave. 
Um, and I'm, I'm really excited to work with some colleagues who are South Africa based uh, on, on that landscape survey so that we can understand better how this cave and what we're finding there fits into everything else that's going on in the region, but also so we can understand a little bit more about the more recent history um, around there. You know, what, who was living on that property 50 or 75 years ago and what was their story and how come they're not, you know, how did they them to be not living on the property anymore, um, what happened to those families and, and, and so forth. And, and that's something I'm, I'm interested in as I wander around the landscape down there. So I'm excited to work on that. Um, and then also through my work at the Explore Center for the Exploration of the Human Journey, um, we're, we're really excited to uh, be uh, supporting and becoming a, a lab for innovation in science communication, specifically for paleoanthropology. Um, so um, I'm excited to be reaching out to more paleoanthropologists in, in North America and all around the world, and especially in South Africa, um, to, so we can help support each other in, in coming up with new innovative ways to communicate the work that we're doing. Cool. Wow. Well, five-year plan. I love it. That's like exactly how I think every day. Like, what am I going to do in the next five years? I will admit that I have given not given up my harness, but I am much more um, motivated to save forests than I am to make new discoveries and do things that I, I think that scientists are expected to do in the U.S., I must admit. So, you know, I have 150 publications or something like that. So my priority in the next five years is I'm building three new canopy walkways because these walkways help save forests by providing ecotourism and income for local people, they save the forest, and it's the, the publications that I would do there won't save the forest, so I'm building a walkway in Bhutan, and another one in Mozambique, and believe it or not, another one in northern Vermont, and I'm working with the indigenous people in northern California called the Yurok Indians to build one up there, so I think that these projects really do more than my publications, because they really save the forest where biodiversity lives. Um, I'm writing a book that I mentioned. It's my kind of passion because I want girls to be better prepared for science than I was. And right now I'm also taking all of my Malaysian work, which includes two canopy walkways over there, and we're proposing a UNESCO World Heritage nomination for a forest there, which is critical because Malaysia is a country where palm oil has caused the degradation of so much forest. So I guess my whole philosophy is trying to find countries and forests that don't have the scientific expertise, again, of a lot of our countries and that are close to the U.S. where there's lots of scientists per square kilometer and trying to help these places get ahead with their forest conservation because if we lose forests in countries that don't have scientists, we still, in the end, have a lot of children without a heritage, and so I'm really passionate about that. Great. I think if we have time for one more question, I'm just, I had a list of questions that I thought people might ask, and just because this is a recording, I would like to um, just get your feedback on it. So for, what what can someone do if they're really passionate about science communication? What can they do to just start getting more involved? Easy, because I used to be a museum director. You can write a column in your local newspaper. You can write to your policymakers because you learn to write a good letter about an issue. You can frame it. You can collect the data. You can talk to schools. You can talk to Sunday schools or Girl Scouts or Brownies. You can create little presentations. I think it's really important to start early. I wish I had done better with that about training yourself to communicate an issue, even starting at home with your family maybe about recycling or how to make your garden, maybe growing vegetables. There are a lot of ways you can communicate activities at a local level that then might someday become national. And, and I would, I agree with all of that and I would add that uh, there are a lot of science communicators on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, um, and Many of them are happy to talk about the work that they do and how they got involved with it, in it and, and what kind of training opportunities might be around. Um, so I would, uh, you know, find the folks who are who have um, forward-facing, public-facing um, profiles on social media and, and 
start find one that you whose work you like and whose work you admire and, and reach out to that person um, and, and start those conversations because a lot of times there are some training opportunities that um, you know that might be a little hard still a little hard to find which is kind of ironic for science communication that it's hard to find the training opportunities but they are out there in some cases so. yeah I something um, I know about people is that they they like to tell you what they know especially if you ask <laughs> So, yeah, my point being ask, don't be afraid to ask. In fact, the per, you know, most often people welcome it. Um, it makes them feel good <laughs> um, if they're admired and, and, and reached out to. So, um, <laughs> my, uh, I'll, my, my daughter, when she was, I think, 11 years old or 10, she wrote a letter every day to um, women around the world to ask their advice that she had just picked and one of them it ended up with an invitation to speak at a UN conference so oh, that's great yeah so you never know where, where it will end up <laughs> so and join and and just keep on taking advantage I would say of, of, of the platforms like this I think this is amazing it's it's so important to to connect and, and share information and ask, um, you know, that's, that's what we do at Wing for All Quest. In addition to Dr. Lohman and Dr. Pichotto, um, you know, we have, you know, over 100, 150 women around the world that connect through um, the, the community that we have and they share information or will reach out to me to ask for um, an introduction. Uh, Dr. Pichotto just did that over the summer in, in working to make um, meet people to share the, the virtual reality platform with and um, you know it's just it, it, it all builds on each other so and and I'm real I'm, we're really grateful for this relationship with the New York Academy of Sciences because we have this amazing community of the, the scientists and you have this fabulous platform um, which I think is brilliant to have this virtual platform for mentoring so it's a really nice um, relationship that we can share uh, together. So thank you. <laughs> so I guess this concludes our event. I just want to say thank you to our partners at Wing. Thank you to the scientists, Dr. Roman and Dr. Pichuto. We greatly appreciate you taking time out of your Saturday night and Saturday afternoon now um, to speak to Thousand Girls community. Um, we learned so much about your research. We learned so much about science communication and why it's important. And um, this is just a great resource for the people in the community. Um, I will share this recording so we can impact other people because we do have over 800 uh, mentors and mentees in the program who can't be here today. I, I don't know how that would be uh, hosting an event for 800 people on WebEx. I think <laughs> it might have been a little bit uh, a little bit of a new experience, so I'll post it online so they can watch it when their schedule permits. So thank you so much, um, and everyone have a great day. Remember, um, you are confident, you are inspiring, and do what makes you happy and share that with someone else. Have a great day. Thanks. Thank you.